You're listening to Podium Podcast with former England rugby player Tom May and leading performance coach Simon Hartley. From locker room gossip to fascinating high performance insights, this is the show that invites some of the biggest names in the world of sport to discuss life on and off the field of play. Podium Podcast is brought to you by True Potential. To find out more, visit www.tplp.com. In last week's episode of Podium Podcast, we talked to Mark Foster about his experience as a professional rugby player with some of England's leading clubs. You can catch up with that episode at bworldclass.tv. In part two of this podcast, the conversation turns to Mark's role as Senior Vice President of Finance with one of sport's most talked about organisations, Live Golf. Let's pick up the discussion with Tom May and Simon Hartley. We, we, we obviously know what, what the background to, to Live Golf is. It, you know, just explain a bit about what, what you're trying to do because you've, you've sort of touched on it very briefly in, in the previous sort of half an hour. But give us, give us a bit of a, an insight into what, what you're building. Um, so I guess the, the ultimate kind of aim of the business is kind of, is pro, you know, true enterprise, free enterprise for, for golf professionals. You know, like we're, we're all kind of uh, ex-sportsmen. And so, you know, you understand that sport is a, is a finite career and, you know, you should be given all the flexibility you want to go and earn in that market, however you see fit. And so for us as a business, we kind of, we looked at it and said, you know, the, the golf ecosystem has been the same since, you know, inception and, um, we believe that um you know innovation will allow us to you know provide that kind of that ability for players to, to fully kind of realize their value um we, we, we for too long we you know we thought that you know the, the current golf ecosystem was run as a not-for-profit and you know we were kind of looking adding up the numbers and realizing that someone somewhere was making a huge amount of money off it and actually it should be the players and not necessarily the people behind the scenes so we just kind of we flipped it on its head. You know, we've got an incredible um, kind of leader, um, in Greg Norman uh, and Yasser Ramayan, um, His Excellency, um, obviously, is very publicly involved as, as well and as the chairman of the PIF um, um, Finance. So, you know, for us, it was, you know, let's do something interesting and different. You know, the average demographic in golf, you know, we were looking at was, you know, late, very, very kind of like 50 plus um, wealthy. And we said, actually, you know, in this day and age, you know, sport should be available to everyone. And, you know, you actually, and then you look at it on the other side of it in my world and you say, right, commercially, if you open up the average demographic down to 30, then you're just the size of the market, you know, quadruples. And that's a very affluent, you know, still a very wealthy market, which still demands, you know, premium sport and entertainment. And then we said, okay, you know, how can we make the format more efficient? You know, there was, you know, everything we're doing is about parity and kind of leveling the playing field. So we, for us, you know, the shotgun start makes more sense because, you know, so many times you'd watch, you know, you know majors, you know, with adverse weather. You know, someone goes out in the morning, best song goes out in the afternoon. Conditions are totally different. It makes 10, 15, 20 shot different. So for us, we were saying, well, if everyone starts at, you know, the same time, then it's a level, it's a true level playing field. Um. So, yeah. And so, and so you know, it was put together by an incredible, um, you know, business, um, or performance 54 in Surrey who you know I knew some of the people who work there um you know Richard Warren who's the CFO there is you know one of the most talented sports finance minds I've ever come, kind of come across and when I was working at Smith and Williamson talking of different kind of things he had we'd done some work together where we'd given some you know some tax advice to the business um and you know Rich and I have known each other for 35 years um and so when they were kind of looking you know to put this opportunity together you know they were looking for obviously people who had you know, really good sports experience and really interesting finance experience across lots of different verticals. And it, so it just, it would be the right place, right time. And it just, um, but the, the business is fantastic. You know, it's, it's golf, but louder. Um, you know, we are putting on world-class golf, but inside events now. So, you know, there is huge music acts. There are, um, you know, really interesting fan experiences for every, every, you know, everyone for, you know, regardless of gender, age. Um, and so it's, it's really, I mean, it's one of my favorite things to do is just walk around our events and, and look at how, you know, this is not just, you know, 50 year old men all wearing the same hats or wearing the same polos with the trout shirts tucked in. This is, you know, everybody, every cross section of society. And then and it, and it, we give back, you know, we, there's a huge, Jake Jones is our head of CSR, is doing an incredible job 
you know, delivering this enormous, um, you know, talking about writing large checks, um, CSR program back to, to, to really kind of how are we growing the game at every level, you know, organically for people who have no ability to access golf or actually, frankly, have no, you know, never really considered it as a sport they would play um, in you know, countries all around the world, every kind of socio-demographic level. Um, and kind of being a part of that, you know, and genuinely trying to disrupt the whole industry is, you know, is fascinating to work in. Um, it is, it moves at lightning speed as, you know, all startups do. Um, and we are incredibly lucky that we do have a, you know, um, a well, very well-funded um, shareholder. Um, but the reality is, you know, sovereign wealth funds, you know, still are here to make money. They're not, it's not a charity. So, you know, in the same way that, you know, every, you know there's lots of stuff written in the press around, you know, like deep pockets, you know, endless resource. They're just simply not the case. You know, they, you know, everyone in this business, the shareholders, the you know, senior team, you know, every single person, you know, this is this will be a profitable business. Um, but you know, the scale of the, you know, the the ecosystem that we come we, that we kind of came up against when we first started meant that you can't just dip your toe in that water. You have to really kind of um, jump in, and um, it's been a you know, brilliant ride. You know, we will, you know, it's, it's commercially going absolutely fantastically you know monica fee who heads up the partnerships um is doing an incredible job um and so you know it, it's just a constant evolution so every event we go to now you know there's more people there there's more sponsors the offering is better and as we're we're growing we're evolving um you know, the franchises all came in this year and we've um you know that, it's incredible to see teams in golf you know you're seeing all the you know fantastic um benefits of like the Ryder cup play but then it's coupled with what the ipl looks like a very similar model um, same as F1, where you have the team and the individual interaction, um, and, you, and then you have this, you know, this global tour. Genuinely, you know, so much of it is so US centric, and for us, it was, you know, growing, growing the game everywhere. So, we were in Mexico a few weeks ago. You know, we're going back to the US next week, and then we're off to, um, you know, Australia, Singapore. Um, you know, Australia, classic example. They've not, you know, they've not had. Well, I think that you, the average golf fan there would say they haven't had like world class golf there for so long. And we see, you know, it's sold out, like it's sold out in like a day and a half. Um, it's incredible. Like, I was looking at the numbers last night and, it, you know, we're having to add new hospitality, add, you know, additional capacity because there is so much demand there. And it's brilliant. You know, it, just, it makes me so happy just to genuinely see that kind of really, really just genuinely changing the game. We hope you don't mind us interrupting the show with a very short message about our partners at the Podium Podcast, True Potential. True Potential provide wealth management that's simple, effective and unique. Their expert advice, innovative investments, leading technology and dedicated support are all designed to help you do more with your money. Visit www.tplp.com now to find out more. Capital at risk. True Potential Wealth Management and True Potential Investments are authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Thanks for listening. Now, let's get you back to this week's show. A lot gets fired at you in terms of verbal battering, um, uh, sort of political-based, people that don't understand, people that do understand or think they understand. So as far as I can see, golf as a sport is a bit like rugby and needs a shake-up. Um, so I don't see it as a bad problem. How how do you counter those arguments, though? Um, I mean, for a long time, I don't know, we even listened to them, you know, because it was when you know you talk about an ecosystem. You do, it's not just the sport; it's the sport, it's the media that goes around it. Everyone, you know, is in that world, gets paid because of that golfer. So when you're going up against that, you know, it's expected that you know there is people who will tow a certain line which is absolutely fine that's kind of that doesn't really have a bearing on what we do um i think you know for me it's you know it, it doesn't really need a huge amount of countering i think you know the, it's the same as sport in that it, it, the results speak for itself i think you know they're you know, very public you know, the pga has has literally copied live and I don't think I'm out of turn saying that in that they are saying, you know, for a long time, they're saying, oh, you can't have, you know, no cut. You can't have you know, these crazy prize purses. You can't have X, you know, and then all of a sudden they're like, we have X. And you can, and there's lots of, it's like any 
kind of decision. You can dress it up how you want um, and you can talk about all the different things that so oh, it's, it's different because of X, Y, and Z. But, you know, you take a step back, it's exactly the same. And so to genuinely, you know, so we have changed not just our ecosystem, but theirs as well. And, you know, there's now you know, some of the best players in the world openly coming out and saying, without Liv, this never happens. Nothing would have changed. And to your point, Tom, you know, if you, if you put your kind of your business hat on, you know, like genuine private equity and like venture capitalism is around finding something that is ripe for innovation and, you know, that you can find efficiencies and use those efficiencies to drive, you know, commercial gain and revenue. Yeah. Um, and you know, and capital profits. So there's, it's no different. And we just are marrying them up. You know, you know, to how do you make a you know going back to writing checks. You know, how do you give sport longevity and the ability to genuinely be agile and move? You make it commercially successful. Okay, how do you make it commercially successful? Right, you just have to start with innovating. How do you you know how do you innovate and change something? Okay, you need a quite a large pool of cash in order to be able to make those innovations. It's not like you know. You can have all the hopes and dreams in the world, but until someone actually goes, here we go, we're going this direction, this is what it costs, let's go. Um, you know, it, nothing changes. You just have you just have lots of people wh- whispering in the background saying, oh, we should do this, we should do that. Yeah. And for us, it was, you know, it, it, there's been various iterations of what live now is kind of over the years and different people have been part of that journey. Greg's been on some of those. Richard Marsh, who is, you know, probably the linchpin of live golf. Who heads up all of the kind of the uh he's the president of franchises um who's also another fantastic ex rugby player uh, <laughs> um you know without with, without all of that um and people just going we're going you know it doesn't it just doesn't happen and so it, you know it, t- it all ties back together and it, it all becomes quite cyclical you know you have to you have to start you have to make your intentions you have to innovate that that's expensive right okay you know any commercial decision to make it sustainable has to have you know a commercial outcome and so you know the, the business is built around you know not just the you know the intangibles around growing the game and genuine adding you know free agency to the market but also you know making this you know commercially successful so you know, we can pass it on to you know, future generations and this innovation in golf can continue um and you know grow into you know the opportunity that's so clear in so many people's minds which is you know, making golf a genuinely global sport, you know, available for all. And that isn't something that's just played by, you know, perceived boring old people, um, you know, in their spare time when they retire. You know, it is a brilliant sport. It marries up athleticism, you know, technical ability, you know, mindset. Just mindset's huge. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, it has all the potential for, you know, all the fun stuff, you know, that has, you know, Twickenham in front of 80,000 people is no different to, you know, someone coming down 18 with 20,000 people on either side of the fairway screaming. Um, but you get to do it, you know, outside. Um, it's just just different and, and another you know, fantastic sport that, you know, is, is something that, you know, we're really passionate about being part of. Tom and I have uh, talked and reflected about sort of dis- disruption, genuine disruption often only happens when you bring people from outside of that industry who come into it with a completely fresh perspective. And you guys have talked about the need for various sports to kind of shake themselves up a bit, um, which doesn't tend to happen if you've got the same people doing the same things in the same way they've always done them. You need people from outside really looking at this and, and questioning it and, and taking the thing apart and before putting it back together again. But my other reflection on disruption is that when people disrupt, they're obviously um, challenging the status quo. So anybody that's invested in the status quo is going to resist that. That's because they're trying to protect what they've got. So there will always be that tension between those who are protecting a status quo and those who are looking to shake it up. Um, and actually, I think it's just one of those natural, natural phenomena that will happen when people are challenging and disrupting. I mean, you're so right. I think the first thing you ever get taught when you, when you, when you kind of start your um your your accounting journey one of the first kind of things that really sticks to me is like the you know doing things where they've always been is the most dangerous thing because you all you're all you're doing is you're just compounding prior errors and what you know i was a really annoying kid i was like why i was a why kid you know like why dad why mom i still am i probably annoy my, annoy my poor wife on a daily basis um but uh <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but then at, at the same time you know it actually 
provides, you know, throughout my kind of working career, you know, some of the most insightful changes in any in things that we've done because, you know, you look at something and you have all this kind of wide knowledge base and you look at something and, and something totally alien to me, like coming from rugby to be working in finance, to be an accountant, to run a business, to help run a business. It's so alien and where you go, you know, why would you do it like that? Um, and then and it was, listening to people's responses, that skill of listening you know, and coaching, um, it's, it's fascinating. We provide some, all the insight because, you know, the, and if someone, someone says, because that's where we've always done it, you just know, you're just like, well, that's, that's fine. Let's, 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 let's pull that apart and let's, let's work through that. And, it, and it's, I think, like I, if, if I look at the composition of my team at the moment, I have, you know, an ex-auditor. I have, you know, you know people who've worked in various you know, large businesses. Ironically, I think the people who are, uh, Liam, Liam Page, who um, heads up all the franchise finance for us, he, um, he's a classic example. He, you know, he worked at Deloitte, but Deloitte in Australia is kind of, you work across all these different disciplines. You don't just do audit or tax. You do rotation, rotation, rotation. And when you then come into wanting to run a commercial entity, these people are so much more valuable and so much more insightful because, you know, they, they understand how it all fits together. And then you, you couple that with a passion for sport, a passion for innovation, a passion for genuine kind of like change um and it becomes you know a really interesting dangerous animal and the conversations spiral into like crazy you know what and then you're looking at how big is the potential you know in something where innovation has never really happened bar you know, the, the technical equipment you know the, the, the shoes they play in you know the format has, has you know has been the same for so long and you're saying, yeah. well, and, and then that's the size of the market. So your, your format produces this market size, this target demographic. And then we're saying, well, <laughs> what if it was different? How big is the market? And then you're like, they're like the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. You're like, wow, okay, that's really exciting. You know, you are, and you wrap with that in something that we all love, which is sport, which kind of provides all of the, you know, the good stuff that children doing sport, for example, have. So you're like, okay. And then how, you know, are there limits to this? And to break through those limits or quite often the biggest barrier is, you know, the ability to access to capital. So when someone says to you, okay, here's this capital, there are no limits. How far can you go? How fast can you go? And then you're like, as a, an entrepreneur and as a, you know, an ex athlete and as a, you know, just a normal person, you're like, wow, okay, let's, I'm pumped. Like let's, how fast can we go? And then going on that journey, you know, and, and, and trying to enjoy that and not be kind of, wow, this is really scary, but actually like this is incredibly exciting, a very privileged, you know, yes, it's taken a lot of hard work to get here, but at the same time, you know, let's all as a group, going back to the sports, going back to the coaching, back to the team, you know, we have to one, enjoy this journey together. One of the things I'd be shocked for not asking, a mate of mine loves his golf. Right. And um, he's a bit of a traditionalist. It, like he's a boring ass. Um, so, <laughs> But one of the things he levels at me is like, well, because I, I say to him, well, I think Live Golf's quite good because it's coming in, it's changing up the market, it's doing X, Y, Z that we've already talked about. His thing is, yeah, but they haven't got the got the TV rights to grow the audience across a wider audience. Yes, you from an event perspective, smashing it. What, what, what are you doing to try and widen that? Because I know there's been some movement on that in the past few weeks, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. So that's all, you know, the the CW deal, which is, I think, 160 million US households, that's obviously public knowledge. You know, I'm sure there'll be a, a significant number of more announcements that will that will give you that genuine global reach. You know, there is huge appetite in these markets. As you see, you go to Australia and you just deliver the event and, you know, 75,000 people in a day and a half go, we absolutely have to be there. You know, whatever it looks like, we'll be there. You know, it's months away. We have to be there. And so, you know, that speaks for itself um, in terms of, and, and that that will, that is coming. You know, that will, that is, you know, if it's not already here and, and not announced, you know, it's, it, you know, weeks, days probably. Um, but it's so much bigger than that. So, like, for us, we, you know, you would be remiss, you know, the, our age, our generation, we watch TV, we watch Blue Peter after school, et cetera. Kids now, something totally different. They, you know, Tommy, you've got a young family. They do Fortnite and they do NFTs and they do crypto and all these kind of jazzy stuff that I'm aware of. Doesn't really hold, doesn't, doesn't really hold much water for me. Um, I'm aware of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. But but so for us, it's kind of you know to your point, Simon, bringing people in different industries. You know, we have you know incredible technical teams. Uh, you know, and I see obviously like the, the, all the inner workings, everything. But you know, you know, golf. 
you know, Tiger Woods is innovating at the moment. He's doing Monday Night Golf, which kind of is a quasi virtual one. I think, you know, beyond that is so much bigger. You know, it's about fan engagement. It's about, um, you know, different mediums. It's around, you know, can someone be there in a VR headset the other side of the world? You know, what is interesting in golf? You know, people want to be, you know, do they want to be, listen to the mic when we have caddies mic'd up? You know, do they want to listen to the caddies and actually listen to those conversations? Because there's so much of that behind the scenes we've seen with, you know, the evolution of, you know, Drive to Survive, you know, Full Swing, the Six Nations documentary, which where people, you know, it's amazing to see that product, you know, end product on a, you know, on a Saturday at Twickenham, but they want to know, you know what goes before that. And they want to be inside and they want to live those kind of vicariously through the screen. So for me, you know, it's that innovation of that, of that um, ecosystem and that reach, I think, is enormous. You know, if you, if you look on, I think Will Steger put, put, the, put the final numbers up, um, which kind of across. So we have our own OTT app now. So that's kind of, you know, fully built out and growing and evolving. You know, there's so much to kind of go on top of that, you know, around, you know, fantasy space, you know, around, you know, NFTs, blockchain, you know, the evolving with you know, the rest of the world and saying, OK, actually, the days of a printed ticket are gone. You know, like how, you know, and then if you are going to attend events, you know, maybe, you know, if you attend these events here, here and here, maybe there's a, spe- you know, a secret, what's behind door three um, and all of that, you know, and making, you know, so many different, you know, we talked already just about like a, a generic demographic who attend golf events, but how do you get people who aren't even golf fans to attend those golf events? You know, you, you tap into what their world is, you know, is their world gaming, is their world fantasy, is their world. You know, it, it, going back to the, you know, the possibilities genuinely are endless. Um, and so for us, it's, you know, the stuff that we love and the stuff, you know, we think is incredible for golf. It's talking to people and dis- who disrupt us from outside of the golf ecosystem and saying, OK, well, this is our world. This is how we think, big we think it can be. And this is the way we think, you know, we interact with society, with, you know, everyone globally. Um, what do you think looking in? And then those conversations are, you know, incredible um, because then people genuinely are like, wow, this is really cool. Like you're doing something um, really technical, really interesting. Um, <laughs> you know, ba- ba- baby shouting someone, um, you know, you're doing, you know, and, and people love that. That you should, It's just a standalone innovation. They're like, oh, this is really cool. Like, you know, and they see the commercial opportunities with it because, you know, it's not just a golf event. It's a golf event with a music festival, with a food festival, you know, all wrapped into one it's then the teams and it's kind of like going on that fan experience journey, you know, like there's a brilliant campaign that Will Newell, who's our, one of our design leads put together, which is about pick your team. And there's kind of just looking at a young girl and, you know, going to all the team captains and, and you know, where something like the IPL started, you know, you have a, you know, geographical nexus. So you, you, you support your local team the same way that all football kids, rugby kids growing up, you grew up in Bath, you support Bath, you know, I grew up randomly in Surrey and supported Bath as a kid, have no clue why. But I did um, I remember going passionately to the, watch Pilkington Cup final against the ABC club, Bath, you know, brilliant rugby. Um, but, you know, with golf, we don't have geographical nexuses, you know, like you have you know, our teams at the moment have, you know, there is, there is, a, you know, there's a South, you know, group of South American, there's some Spanish, you know, there's lots of different American teams, you know, so why support one over the other? Going down that kind of fan narrative to kind of uh, you know, look at what is actually behind those teams, because, the opportunity, like for me as a capitalist, is like you look at this and say, this is like having an IP, you know, day one IPL franchise, you know, or a day one NFL franchise or an NBA franchise, you know, like what what makes them unique? Is it their playing style? You know, is it the the narrative that goes behind that? Is it the personalities? Is it the way it's run? Is it kind of what it does in society? And that is such a brilliant kind of process at the moment where we're just seeing you know, and I've seen that journey through where, you know, we started engaging with players about this you know, when we first started and, you know, people just like, I don't, I don't get it. You know, it's, it's, it's an individual sport. And then uh, that evolution as it's grown and the idea has grown. And now, the, you know, they, those people are the most engaged people. And they're like, okay, this is what I want to do. You know, this is how I want to grow, grow this team, grow this franchise and turn it into this, you know, standalone um, you know, monster. Um, and, and it's, I think going back to the sports psychology piece, it's huge. You see the guys on the course, you know, where it's tough. And like golf's brutal. It's very, very under the microscope. It's, you know, one mistake costs you, you know, a lot of money, a lot of money. <laughs> like you see guys and you've seen it, you know, like over the years, people blow up on, you know, final rounds of majors and all kinds of things. Having that team environment, that just changes it in the same way that you can boil rugby down to an individual sport because it is, you know, ultimately it's one-on-one generally. 
you know, and it's who wins that collision, who wins the thing, having that team around you to support you and to facilitate that and to, you know, emotionally kind of bond with and lick your wounds when it goes badly and celebrate, you know, when it goes well is huge. And you see these teams already, already growing. It's just started off like four players, four caddies. And now it's four players, four caddies, four partners, you know, four players, four caddies, four, with the four partners, four, you know, kids. And then you've got, now you've got the commercialization of that. And so it's kind of, how do you make that team better? So you know, it's performance scientists, it's nutritionists, it's, you know, all these different things that allow you to, you know, interact the commercial with the actual sport, which is what we're ultimately talking about, you know, it's, and, and grow that um, and grow, but just not just on the course, but off the course. Um, so wrapping all of that together is the fascinating piece about my job, because you see, you know, so much of that starts with the numbers ultimately. Um, yeah. We have like an amazing, you know, group of um, people around the world and there's offices in Florida and New York. London, obviously, um, and you know these people. To your point again, Simon, you know people who are outside the industry. You know, like finding people who have built a golf business. You know, there's only there was only one golf golf business before, so you know we weren't actually going really and hiring those people because yeah. you know they they didn't necessarily agree with what we we're doing. So you you go out and you look at different people from you know, who have done events delivery before, who have done you know you look at the production team. And so these are some of the best people in TV production in the world, and the joys of having that ability and, you know, like well, well capitalized business is that you can go and hire the best. You can go and hire people who genuinely move the needle in their industry and they put them all in a massive melting pot and go, go. Yeah. Um, pretty, and, and, you, mean, and just hold on. Yeah. <laughs> pretty compelling when you're trying to build a, build yeah. a brand new version. The, we, we always end these yeah. podcasts with, uh, with four quick fire questions. Um, okay. So, See what see what you make of these. If you weren't a pro athlete, I've got I've got a bit of an idea with this one. If you weren't a pro athlete, <laughs> what would you have been? <laughs> um, probably probably an accountant. I probably would have actually ended up as a banker. I would have probably I think when I was probably thirty five and you came into finance, you could earn a lot more as a banker. That's just the reality. But the hours are brutal. Yeah. Um, and you just don't want to do that at thirty five. Like in your twenties, <laughs> you want you want to work a seventy hour week, crack on. Like you got nothing else to do. Yeah, like yeah, just chasing girls. You, you say I probably would have been. It would have been in finance, but maybe a slightly different part of it. Who is the person you admire most in sport and in business? Um, oh, it's a tough one. So in business, probably Mark, Mark, a guy called um, Mark Webb. So he's the head of um, head of I don't know tax for Smith Williamson. He was the first guy I ever gave my first proper accounting job, and I like genuinely like shit the bed a few times on that journey. And he was the guy who like picked me up and was like, you know, it's fine. You make mistakes. Don't do it again. He's a, you know, he's a, a, again, a very talented ex rugby player. And, you know, he was instrumental and I still see him, you know, quite regularly now. And, you know, he kind of has that mentoring role where he is, you know, he's a, he talk about people with skill sets. He is a tax barrister who then retrained as an accountant and then got, went on to relieve, you know, like a monster multi-billion dollar business. Um, and it's just, you know, genuinely a really good bloke as well and has that ability to be very technical and very weird and loose at the same time, which I particularly love. Um, in sport, so, um, sport's a tough one. Someone like Tommy Hayes, I think, is probably someone for me and Rob Baxter, who are like almost the same person, almost indistinguishable people in terms of like people with like workmanlike, you know, so much raw talent, but so humble with it and just like, just get on and do their job and drag everyone else with them. You know, that for me is, you know, the sign of incredible leaders and incredible, you know, athletes who, you know, are almost to an extent like unaware of how brilliant they are um, and what they add to an environment and, you know, they, and just such a pleasure to be around and to learn off and to work with, you know, those, you know, for me, I, there's lots of people, you know, like I was very lucky to have Mike Tyndall as like, you know, someone who kind of looked after me when I was younger at Gloucester and Ian Bolshaw, James Simpson, Daniel, you know, these are, world-class people who are you know genuinely wonderful wonderful people who will go out of their way to you know to kind of you know to make you feel like you belong in an environment which maybe you know everyone has I still get imposter syndrome on a daily basis sometimes and you know people who kind of negate that and now you know my biggest goal is to kind of make when people come and work in our business and they start to sit like peek under the hood of this monster and they're like shit it's bigger than I thought and uh, you know it's to be like no you deserve to be here you know, you're in the right place you know Let's get on that journey together. Uh, you've got some funds. It's quite apt, I think. Uh, you've got some funds to invest. What are you going to invest it in? <laughs> <laughs> um, at the moment, 
I don't know. Like I, I, I did a, the next side a few years ago when I kind of came at rugby and a, a guy did this like, his life coach. He's a friend of mine. Um, <laughs> sounds horrendous saying, but he's actually very good at it. You know, <laughs> they do this exercise where basically what you do is you imagine you walk out your front door and your current self stops at the front door and your future self walks forward. He's like, what's your house like? And you can see my house like there. And he's like, walk out the front gate, turn backwards. What does the ha- person now see for the person in the future? And I always saw a property developer. For me, that was something like I love doing because I don't, I'm not a formal person. Like I'm always underdressed. So I wanted to, you know, didn't have to wear a suit to work, you know, get, working as the counter for years in white shirts and blue suits, just like drove me mad. Um, so I was like wearing jeans, boots, blazer, lots of fun, different things, different projects. You know, if I do one thing, I know myself well enough to know if I do one thing endlessly, I just get very, very bored. So something with loads of variety and something like property development. I love the tangible nature of it. I was worked in real estate for a long time before I was in sports. I love the tangible nature of it. I love the fact that you are, you know, building and shaping something for someone to go on and enjoy, uh, you know, uh, and, and to benefit, you know, future generations, something that will stand the test of time if you do it properly and do it right. It's something where I can actually ro- literally roll my sleeves up and, you know, get stuck into it. Um, so that's probably where I've got at the moment. If I'd spare, we always joke about, you know, I've just sold this place and we're going down to Surrey. Um, so that literally has tied up every penny I own. <laughs> but in the future, when, when you know, we can, you can always make more money. Um, you know, yeah. we'd, we'd love to go and, you know, build a, like a timber a timber framed um, house somewhere, you know, in the countryside and have all the things you want in it um, and, you know, build something for my children and you know, their children, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this is the highbrow one. What You've got one film to watch for the rest of your life. What's it going to be? Van Wilder. Unbelievable. <laughs> I had it on when I first went to Gloucester. We had, we were given as part of our first ever deal. We, they, were, they, they were building the new University of Gloucester campus. And they built this tiny little skinny block on the end. It was a last minute addition, which was just rugby players. They built it next to the student union. So there's like me, Luke Narraway, Rob Elloway, Andy Frost, Andy Guess, and Mike Guess um, in there, Neil Hunter. And it was just like, as expected, it was absolute chaos. And I had a tiny little, it's like brand new, like perfectly little kind of um, little student room, you know, plastic, plastic curtains on the suite. You could, couldn't swing a cat in. No, not even a single bed. Like I would lie sat sideways and struggle to get in it. Um, and I had a little Bush 15 inch DVD combi when they were big in 2002. And I had Van Wilder in there. It was the only DVD I had bought with me for my parents' house for some reason. And it stayed in there for the entire year. And my entire days were just like, get in, shower, get in bed for a bit before the phone would ring and be like, student union in 10 minutes. Um, and just flick it on. And so like, I, I'm word perfect on Van Wilder. Um, <laughs> and it's, and it will always be associated with this like very, you know, joyous time in my life where your first year rugby player, I think it was eight grand a year plus you know some food and you know so you're getting paid absolutely nothing yeah but you felt like the richest man in the world you know my 400 pounds a month went you know, no bills to pay nothing to worry about I just gotta buy my food and you know as many beer and kebabs I can get down me on a student night on one pound vk's and so that, that that film for me will always be kind of you know I, I don't barely watch it now but like it will always be associated with like the you know the happiest point in your life where you're like you know, you're in the academy, so you've got no, you don't have the pressures of senior rugby. You don't have, you know, I was studying broadly, but never finished a degree there. Um, and all you're doing was just like hanging out with your mates, living the dream, you know, chasing girls around Gloucester and Cheltenham. And, you know, it, that, it was just like a very, very happy part. I mean, obviously not as happy as now, but like, it was just something that growing up, you just like, you know, this is, this is everything I thought it would be and more. So yeah, always Van Wilder. Like it. Hey mate, it's been great to have you on the podcast. Uh, hope everything goes well for the for the sort of starting new season, and uh, we look forward to seeing how it progresses. Thank you for having me. Been uh, been really good fun, and um, I'll see you both soon. Cheers, Mark. Cheers, bye. You're listening to Podium Podcast with former England rugby player Tom May and leading performance coach Simon Hartley. From locker room gossip to fascinating high-performance insights, this is the show that invites some of the biggest names in the world of sport to discuss life on and off the field of play. Podium Podcast is brought to you by True Potential. To find out more, visit www.tplp.com.